matematici scrivuto I will translate for you this because you have to understand deeply what is it. A first quick translation could be mathematics is written for mathematicians, which means not. And this has been used, this sentence, against Copernicus and against You know, you can bend words and sentences to the meaning which you like if you are not using mathematics. Because the beauty of mathematics is that one sentence means only one thing. In Greek, uh, this word in Latin is obtained more than a <laughs> Please, come in. It is okay. molding a Greek word. This can be split in two parts. This means those things which, for being understood, need to be longly studied. Greek is a wonderful language. It has a structure which is very rich. And it is like German. You build words, gluing them all together. Sorry, I didn't dare to hope you were coming. <laughs> I'm German. I said 850 and right about it. So I started with Copernicus. So mathematica means, I repeat, those things which, for being understood, need to be longly studied. So this sentence means <coughs> shortly before discussing study a lot, before saying that my uh, book is empty or it's not good. You must study a lot. I wrote this book for those who are ready to study a lot. So Copernicus, starting talking about his uh, explanation about the world, wanted to underline that you cannot judge a mathematical theory without having studied it in detail. Okay? So, what we, we need to study? I promised to comment that I wanted, I, I, I was ready to teach you the theory of deformation of bodies. Okay? which is a very complicated theory, which needs a lot of mathematics. Why? Because the phenomena we are describing are very complicated. So, who can believe that a complex phenomenon can be described with simple ideas? My son is always asking me to explain him complex things in two words. Okay? So, for instance, when he was young, he told me, why you cannot divide times zero? In two words, you can divide times zero is five words. The fact that you have a zero which has the very strange property that 0 times x is always equal to 0 for every x. This is killing you. You will never get x, x times 0 equal 1. 
so you can never be right. Song. Now you see. Okay. You know, usually one over a times a equal one. So zero times one over zero should be equal to one. But zero times everything is always zero. So you need to understand the deep structure of real numbers. This cannot be explained in a simple way. Okay? So what we have to understand is the mathematics which is behind the theory of deformable bodies. You cannot describe the phenomenon of deformation without understanding some deep mathematics which, by the way, has been developed exactly in order to study the theory of the formula. Okay. So this is another statement I wanted to tell you before going back. Okay, of course, we are not mathematicians. We want to describe some physical phenomena. So we need to use two for a while we look at the phenomenon as a physicist and we try to understand what is happening. Then we take away the heart of the physicist, we, we take the heart of the mathematician and we try to describe mathematically the phenomenon. This is what we call mathematical physics. So I want to show you some movies. I want to show you some movies which should motivate what we are trying to do. The movie I used for a presentation in Lansing, in a conference. Here. Let me see if it works. These are phenomena. I have a bunch of carbon fibers and I do this experiment. Okay, these are facts, nobody can discuss what is that. Okay? Now I look for This is the good one. This is the bad one. Now, I use a mathematical model which was invented by Cauchy in 1850 and which became a computer model recently. What is proving this experiment? Numerical experiment. Our mathematical model is not working. It's not giving the correct, the correct for a casting. I show you another time this. And then I try to show you again facts. These are facts. The wings after the uh, points of contact 
are going up while in the numerical simulation these waves are remaining more or less horizontal. So this is an example of mathematical model which is not forecasting the physical behavior, the phenomena. Uh, by the way, in Greek, phenomena means what is apparent. Okay. So, if you use the theory of the formable bodies as described by Hoshi, you are not able to study the behavior of this material. Now, this material is a material which is used for airplane wings or for building composite materials in airplanes. So, there is a, the reason for which I don't have uh, very well focused movies is that this material is a secret. So uh, actually uh, we, we I could not leave it on the computer of the conference for instance. I needed to use my own. Now I want to uh, discuss with you the motivations for which I will ask you to uh, deeply study some mathematical Theories of ideas. We need to describe the behavior of physical objects before building them. You cannot build 300 airplanes and then check if it is flying or not. You cannot build 200 ships and see if it is floating or not. You need to be able to forecast which will be the behavior of your built device before building it. So you need a mathematical model which is described in a very, very accurate way the future physical system the one which you have not yet already built. Okay? Copernicus was writing some equations by means of which he could forecast the position of planets in the solar system. So he could forecast future. Actually, Copernicus was rediscovering an ancient Greek knowledge. You know, Mar Mar Marcellus, the, the man who conquered Syracuse, came back to Rome with a computer, an analogical computer, a planetarium, which has been seen and described by Plutarch. And this system was, you turn a wheel, and all planets were moving around the sun and you could see the date on the wheel. So they knew how to do it. This knowledge has been lost during the Middle Ages and then has been painfully recovered by Kepler, Copernicus, Galileo, and so on. Why? Because some Roman politicians decided that mathematics was not useful. There is a direct connection between the Middle Age and the loss of mathematical knowledge. Okay, so which is our uh, target? Our target is to understand the theory of the form of bodies to apply this theory to understand the behavior of some uh, systems and to learn to use uh, a console for 
forecasting the behavior of some systems. Okay? However, I need to be bold. You know, you shouldn't believe that I am schizophrenic. Uh, I'm talking now about philosophical visions, but in 10 minutes we start doing some very technical things. Technicalities are nothing if you don't have a vision. You must, you must understand what you are doing and why. Okay? Vision without technicality is empty words. You will become a scientist if and only if you have a vision and a technical capability. Okay? You will be an engineer if and only if you have a technical capability. The engineer is not the man who shouts orders to workers. The engineer is that person who sits, makes calculations, and knows before building something what will happen to the object is going to build. Okay? Okay. Now I must warn you. Theories are sometimes dangerous. Theories are like a Weltanschauung, the German word for vision of the world. So when you start using a theory, you take some glasses and you see around you with these glasses, spectrums. Okay? So if in your lenses there is a distortion, you believe that reality is distorted, while the distortion is in your lenses. Cauchy developed a theory which works for some materials. Engineers believe that all materials were behaving as forecasts by Cauchy. So in a given moment, in engineering schools, they started believing that everything was described by the theory of Cauchy, so they forgot they had in their hands a theory describing a particular side of reality, a particular part of reality. And they believed to have the theory of everything in their hands. Okay? Now, as I told you yesterday, uh, this is the year of the fixation of about Gabriel Viola. I, I, I have periodic fixations. Okay, this fixation is costing me a lot because I'm translating in English all the works of Gabriel Viola because this man wrote in Italian. Okay, you belong to a nation in which you are very nationalistic, you write everything in Polish, even if it is a language which cannot be understood by nearly anybody in the world. Okay. Italian is more or less like Polish. Nobody understands Italian nowadays. So the books of Gabriel Viola are not studied apparently. Now Gabriel Viola in 1824, then in 1848, and then in 1856 remarked that he died in 1850, but his pupil, Francesco Brioschi, published his last memoir six years later, violently criticized the point of view of Cauchy, claiming that many phenomena could not be 
described with the theory of Cauchy. However, engineers decided to do the following. If a system is not obeying, is not following the behavior for a cast by Cauchy theory, then we don't use it. You have to understand this point. A physicist is describing phenomena, phenomena outside a physicist. He cannot do anything for changing. So if he's studying Big Bang, he cannot do another experiment. He has the Big Bang, really. He has to find the equations for Big Bang. The engineer, instead, can decide. I do not know how to how to describe the behavior of the system? I ignore it. I'm not using it anymore. But you know what happens next? The engineer forgets about the existence of those objects they are ignoring. And after a while, students and new engineers believe that the theory they are using for a particular part of phenomena are valid for all phenomena. Gabriel Viola, in this memoir, if you have studied something about history, you should know that this is the year of big revolutions in Europe. Also in, in, in Poland, you had a moment of big revolutions in Italian, we say you are doing a 48 for meaning that you are doing a revolution. Okay, so I, I, I need to shoot that also in Polish to say the same. Okay? In this memoir, he describes exactly in words the mechanical behavior of tissues for modern composites and says look if you have these systems the model of Cauchy is not working nobody read this book even if it is available in Google you can download it in Google but it is written in Italian So I talk about the straight jacket. You know what is a straight jacket? It's that jacket which ties crazy people. Okay? The straight jacket of Cauchy theory. You must be free. Your brain must be without any straight jacket. So, you should know always where are the limits of your theory. When somebody is teaching you a new theory, if he's not telling you where are the limits, You must look for them by yourself. There is no theory for everything. Every theory is applicable to a given set of phenomena. Okay? Okay. Now we start the technical part of this lecture. Hmm? We consider a set of points, which are the mathematical model of your body. Usually, this set of points is drawn with a potato-like shape, like this. This potato-like uh, set of points could be continuous or discrete. Ah, by the way, I hope that you know what real numbers are. I hope that you know that real numbers 
and rational numbers are not the same thing. I hope that you know that square root of 2 is not rational. Okay? I was told these things when I was 14 years old. If somebody decided that you should not know this, is a representative of the coming Middle Age, and you should fight against this. You can fight it only in one way. Take a book and learn this. My father was a lawyer all his life, but when he was in high school, he learned that square root of two is not rational. And he claims that he became a good lawyer for this. Okay. So this set of points could be a finite or a continuum set of points. So you could imagine to have some Cartesian system with some lines and in particular you could imagine that the points in the crossing of these Cartesian lines the intersection of these lines are the discrete system of points you are considering so I want to uh, fix your ideas. We can deal with atoms which are localized in some points, in some nodes. We can deal with a continuum system of points occupying a region in the Euclidean space. Okay? You label it each of this point with the coordinates, Cartesian coordinates, in a given Cartesian system. Okay? So you have chosen a reference system and you have chosen a potato, you have chosen a set of points in this potato, and this is your mathematical model of one shape of your body. Okay? I, I, I don't know if you know who Plato was. Plato was a great philosopher. This is the Platonic idea of a body. This is the model, mathematical model, of a shape of a, a body. Okay? Okay. This body is located nowhere. This is a shape. Okay? We call this shape Lagrange configuration. of the body. Okay? This is the Lagrange configuration of this body. Now, you need to describe where this body is placed in space. So, what you need is another reference this reference now is the reference of the set of locations. So you have a set of places which can be occupied by material points. Okay? Can we talk about motion without distinguishing between material points, which are the points here, and places where material points are located? You cannot. Because motion is, quote, the change of place of material points. 
the same material point in different moments is occupied in different places. Okay? This is what is happening with motion. So the idea is now to formulate a mathematical structure which is suitable for describing motion. Okay? We introduce a map. A map in the sense of set theory, in the sense of mathematical analysis. You consider a given point capital X. This is a material point. This material point is placed in small x, a position. Okay? Ah, I don't want to uh, waste my time with indices. So capital X is three numbers. The three numbers needed for choosing the material point here. And small x is another choice of three numbers, which are the coordinates of the place where capital X is located. So, I need this function. small x as a function of capital X, which is the placement function. We call it placement. Okay? Now you understand immediately the reason for which you need the theory of functions of many values. Because if you want to represent the placement, once you have chosen a reference in the Lagrange configuration and a reference in the set of places, positions, okay, you will be able to write x1 equal k1 of capital x1, x2, x3 x2 equal k2 cardinal x1, x2, x3 and small x3 equal k3 cardinal x1, x2, x3 We are uh, lazy so we invented a shortcut for this formula which is absolutely equivalent. This is an element of R3. This is an element of R3. This is a mapping between R3 and R3. And this short equation means this long equations, system of equations, where x1, x2, and x3, and capital x1, capital x2, and capital x3 are real variables. Okay? So you should not believe that this is something cryptic, which cannot be understood, and this is something clear, which is easier to understand. They are the same thing. If you try to write equations in this way, you need a lot of space. That's all. Okay? You are not calling somebody with the name of his grandfather, father, mother, and all grandmothers and so on. You invent a notation which characterizes very well a concept 
and you consistently use it. Okay, now let us look at these three functions, real functions of three real variables. Okay? Imagine that your body is not cut. So the shape of your body is not dramatically changed by some discontinuities which could be cut. You know, I, I was wrong because I said discontinuities. I have already mixed the phenomena with my mathematical model. Continuity is the mathematical model for describing lack of cuts. We could say that cutting is a phenomenon and continuity or absence of discontinuity is the mathematical model for this kind of phenomenon. So if your body passing from the Lagrangian configuration to the Sometimes this is called a layer configuration because Euler was studying the bodies in their actual shape. Okay. If the body in the passage between the Lagrangian configuration to the Eulerian configuration is not cut, then the three functions k1, k2, and k3 are continuous. Or, if you like, we model the changes of shapes which are not involving cuts by means of continuous functions. Okay. The This is already a straight jump, if you like. If you want to describe the onset of cracks in a body, then this happens. Al aluminum of the aeronautical structures very often is subject to damage with opening of cracks. This model needs to be modified if you want to describe this, this damage phenomenon somehow. Okay? So, we need for the moment our attention to functions k which belong to the set of continuous functions c. c. So, what we are doing, we are not able to study the onset of cracks. So, it could seem to you that this being extremely precise is useless. Instead, you need to understand that every theory has some limits. Mathematical model which we are going to develop is applicable only to changes of shapes which are not involving cuts. So if one day somebody will ask you to describe damage phenomena, you must change your model somehow. Okay? Ah, uh, Piola, Lagrange, studied a lot continuous functions. Actually, the modern definition of a continuous function is due to Cauchy, who invented the correct formulation of the concept of limit. So I hope that you, you have a knowledge of what is a continuous function.
Okay. Now we must do another step. The next step is the following. Imagine that a volume of this body, which is positive, in the actual configuration, becomes a surface having zero volume. This can happen in some sense. Okay. We have to be very careful. Somebody could say that it never happens. Because you take that volume, you crush it, it will have a small volume but always no vanish. Okay? You should never interpret your mathematical models in a literal way. Okay? We'll talk about this philosophical aspect in the next lecture. Okay? What happens is that your function t okay, could map a finite volume into a set of position having zero. This is mathematically possible. Do we want to allow to our placement to behave this way? Lagrange, Cauchy, and Viola decided that they wanted to limit themselves to the case in which this is not happening. So, they needed to find a formula which is expressing the volume occupied in the Eulerian configuration by a given volume in the Lagrangian configuration in terms of the function k. Okay, so this is a concept which usually is studied in mathematics. Calculus or mathematical analysis second year. Okay, we decided that we stop and talk about mathematics when we need for developing our mechanical. So Indeed, this is more complicated for you because you must continuously talk about phenomena, mathematical model, mathematical properties. But I think this is very important for you. So let us try to do, to do this kind of thing. So, it is conceivable that the function k Met a cube of volume 1 into a region of volume 0. Being a continuous function. This can happen. Mathematicians are very good in showing examples and counter examples. But if we interpret this in terms of mechanical concepts and phenomena, what means a placement which is mapping a cube of finite volume into a region of zero volume? This is actually has been used as a model of Crunching. Imagine to have a material in which you have a dramatic collapse of a part of this material. So you could, you could imagine that such a function k is the model of this dramatic 
failure of the system. Okay? We want to exclude this. So we want to avoid the set to exclude from our reasonings the functions k which are making final volumes into zero volumes. There is a beautiful theorem which is called the theory of change of variables. If you have integral over a volume of a given function f, I call it this function of small x. Okay? You can say that this integral is equal to an integral what is k minus 1 of v. You consider the set v. And then you consider all points which are mapped in V by the function T. So this angle is K minus 1 V. Formally, this is equal to the set of X such that K of X belongs to V. So in our mechanical uh, in our mechanical interpretation of these things, k minus 1v is the set of all points which are placed in v. But you know, this theorem is valid in general. Easier 
to work late sometimes. Okay? J, I must tell you what is this. You take the functions k1, k2, k3, and you have built so-called Jacobian matrix in this way. In the particular case, 
when f is equal to 1, this is the volume of D. Okay? Then, if this is 1, we discover something very useful. I have a body, I have the platonic idea of the body, okay? I have the placement of this body, which is given in terms of the function k1, k2, k2. I want to calculate the volume of the region occupied by the set of material particles which are inside V. How can I calculate it? I need to know the Jacobian determinant of the placement function. Because the integral of the Jacobian function over the set of particles which are occupying V, this gives me the volume, the actual volume of my past V. If something having a volume positive must keep a positive volume, then this animal must be positive. Because if, imagine that this is zero, then M, the volume occupied by V, becomes zero. Okay? So, I, I like very much to spend all this time in discussing this point. Why? Because in the books, you very often find the following statement. We assume j of x greater than zero. Why? This is a mathematical assumption, which is true. It is a mathematical assumption, which is its geometrical and or mechanical meaning. Its geometrical and or mathematical meaning is the following. We assume that a region of a set of material particles, so a region of the shape of the body in the reference configuration, positive, having positive volume, maintains a positive volume in the actual configuration. So you don't have any crash inside your body. In order to be assured of this, you must accept one, that all partial derivatives of the function k, k exist, and that the determinant of the Jacobian matrix is always absolute value, is always positive. Again, this is an assumption. This is an hypothesis. Okay? Ah, I hope that you know that if a function has all derivatives, <laughs> partial derivatives, which are, then this function is continuous. So, the existence of partial derivatives suitably regular and assume that they are continuous, assure you that the function itself is continuous. So we usually say the following K belongs to the class C1. 
it is continuous with all its actual derivatives. So we are studying the changes of shape which verify particular assumptions. There are no cuts and there are no crunches. What means cuts? What means crunches? I don't know. We could discuss hours. If I tell you that the function k belongs to the class C1, I have given a precise statement whose meaning is uniquely determined. You know, computers like definitions like this because they are able to handle them. If you ask a computer what is a, a body which is not cut, the proof will not understand. Okay? Why? If you require it is belonging to the class of C1, he understands. Okay? Okay. Okay, I, I, I will end the lecture and look. What time is it? Do you know? Half past nine. Half past nine. So we go ahead for another half an hour. Why? Because we need to talk about an important function k. Of course, if the determinant of j, uh, the, uh, the j, so the determinant of Jacobian matrix, is different from one, you have a change of volume, therefore you have a deformation. So we are proceeding slowly to characterize deformation of a volume. So we, we are starting to understand that the function k is very important for describing the deformation. However, there are functions k1, k2, k3 which are not deforming the other body. In other words, they keep the shape unaltered. Okay? So now the important thing is we must understand how these functions are made. Okay? So what we want? We want a function k which is keeping the shape of the body not changed. This is another strange statement. I don't know if the the paper of, of 1826 of Piola is the first one where the reasoning I am showing you now is developed. However, we could find it there. So this is a very old reason. Take your potato-like shape. Consider the point x1 and the point x. Okay? And then assume that the distance of x1 and x2 is equal to the distance between k of x1, k of x. What we are assuming? Given two points, the distance between their platonic shape 
and the actual placement is the same. Of course, this is not a precise statement. Assume that for every x1 and x2, the distance between x1 and x2 is equal to the distance kx1, kx2. Then we say that the shape of the body is not changed. Uh, by the way, in order to become teacher in high school in Italy, until 20 years ago, you needed to pass an exam about these functions, which are called isometries. And these functions were studied in high school. There is an ancient memory about the importance of these functions. They recently found some mechanisms built during the Hellenistic time in which clearly the knowledge about these functions is reflected. Meaning, you find that the engineer building these mechanisms needed to know what an isometry is. Okay. Now, what can we do with this definition? A lot. Being precise, this definition becomes soft. Okay. Maybe uh, the details of this I will leave to uh, the younger colleague Luca Placidi, who will do the second part of this lecture later. But I give you a list of results. Okay. Luca, we decided to go slow with you. Slower than we had forecast before. So I, I will leave to you the proof that isometries are linear functions and that the matrix is orthogonal. Okay? So, but I will give now all, all the results. There is a first. Theorem, which we can do rather easily. A function k is preserving distance if and only if k of x1 minus k of x0 you choose an x0 as you like in your body is equal to a linear function L applied to x minus x0 and to L transpose is equal to L minus 1. So we need to slowly say L. Okay. In general, this function K can be what it wants. Okay. If you impose that it is preserving distances, then it becomes a very particular applicable method. Which kind of map it becomes? You take your reference 
configuration. You choose a point x0. You can do it in the way you prefer. Then you choose another point, generic one x1. The difference between kx1 minus kx0, which is a vector, depends linearly on the vector x minus x0. So, this difference, which in general can be added for isometries, is a linear function. Not only the linear map has a very peculiar structure. First of all, it has an inverse. And second, this inverse is equal to its transpose. Okay. Now, maybe we need to tell in more detail what is a linear map. What is the transpose? What is the inverse? Because otherwise your faces will remain astonished as they are now. Okay? So, if you have a vector space V1 and another vector space V2, a map from V1 to V2 is linear if this happens <coughs> for every alpha, beta, real numbers and for every V1, V2 vectors. What is a linear function? Either you calculate the linear combination of vectors with scalars, and then you apply L. Or you first apply L, and then you calculate the linear combination, the result is the same. Okay? So, I hope that you have seen that every linear map given a basis of the vector space V1 can be represented in terms of a matrix. Okay, if not, Luca will do the job to show you this. Okay? So this is the first the first statement, the first definition. Can we find the inverse map? Uh, uh, the inverse map is a map from V2 to V1 which verifies the following property L of L minus 1 of a vector W is equal to W and L minus 1 L of a vector V is equal to so if you have a vector v here you map it using l you find something which is lv then you apply l minus 1 you go back to your starting vector v. And you can write the other arrows for this equation. Okay? Now, the problem is, do you have always an inverse V1? 
linear function given a linear function L, not in general. You have an inverse if and only if the determinant of L is different from L. So the determinant of L different from zero is the necessary and sufficient condition for the existence of the inverse. Okay? Now, very important is the definition of transpose. We have a linear product. Okay. Do you remember? Uh, these kind of lectures are very useful because they oblige me to think all details. Uh, you sometimes forget the details if you use them too often. Given two vectors, you can define the inner product of these two vectors. <coughs> there are two ways for defining the inner product. One is geometrical, the other is Cartesian, and these two definitions are equivalent. So let us talk about the geometrical definition. You have the vector V, the, ve the vector W, and the angle theta between these two vectors. You are translating in Bokash. You call it scalar product. What can you do? This is equal to the length of V times the length of W times the cosine of T. This is the definition, geometrical definition of inner product. It is not trivial and it is one of the big conquers of Cartesian geometry, the fact that if you represent V in a basis, orthonormal basis, and W in, a, in the same orthonormal basis, this number is also equal to the sum of VI, WI, summation over I. I mean, the equivalence of these two definitions is not trivial. Okay? But these two definitions are equivalent. Now I ask you the question, which is the basic one in our, in our discussion. If a map is keeping the distances fixed. What happens to the angles? I tried to draw something to show you this. I have a map which is Preserving distances. So A is going there, B, C. Of course, I must be precise. This is K of A, K of C. Of 
So this is Lagrangian configuration, this is the Omega configuration. The distance between A and B, B and C, and C and A are kept the same. It is a trivial result of uh, Euclidean geometry that these angles are equal. Okay? So in the passage between reference configuration and actual configuration, if the distance are kept invariant, also the angles are kept invariant. And if the angles and the distance are kept invariant, then inner product is kept invariant. So what is crucial in our study of isometry is that the inner product is kept in mind. Okay? Keeping the distances means that the inner product is kept in mind. But you, you will see this in detail. Okay. So we can conclude with the definition of the transpose. You consider the inner product in V1. And you have another inner product in V2. Okay? So, you have need to use symbols in an alphabetical way. W2 inner product L V1. This is a vector in V2. This is a vector in V2. This is the inner product in V2. Okay? The transposed map is this strange animal. It takes vectors in V2 and maps it in V1. So L transpose goes like the inverse. Okay? And this transpose is playing this nice game. If you calculate this single product, then this equality is not. So, uh, or this here should be be two. Sorry? Uh, on the right. Here. Uh, no. Here. Now, right. V1. Yes. Look. I have a vector here. I have a vector here. Okay. L is mapping vectors in V1 in V2 and W is a vector in V2 this animal is a vector in V2 so this is inner product in 2 in the arrival space ok V1 is a vector in V1 W2 is a vector in V2. L transpose W2 is a vector in V1. So I have the inner product in V1. 
this game now seems to you an abstract uh, reason, but uh, this is talking about the shape in the reference configuration, and this is talking about the shape in the actual configuration. So this game you need to learn very well. Okay? Okay, so we can conclude this presentation in, in the following way. Recalling the, the second part of the thesis of the theorem you have to, to put. If K is preserving distance, then L transpose is equal to L minus 1. In general, these two are different, but for isometric mappings, they are the same. A linear mapping such that the transpose is equal to the inverse is called, is called orthogonal. Orthogonal. Because it keeps orthogonal. 